soundtrack to this sermon this morning. Testing, testing. Testing. If there's a soundtrack, it's going to go something like this. It's going to end with this sound. I want you to complete it. This is audience participation time. You ready? Good. All right. So we all know where we are. Mission Impossible. It's a franchise, and I can use this freely here because young people will think of Tom Cruise. Did you think of Tom Cruise when you saw me up there? Okay, the answer is this, and if you have to lie, lie. Did I look like Tom Cruise up there? Yeah, all right, all right. You'll think of Tom Cruise in all those great movies. For you old people, you'll think of whatever that guy was who was in the show. It was ran for five years. Anybody? Peter Graves. How many thought of Peter Graves? Did I look more like him? Don't answer that. That's good. Just draw on anything you want to. Mission impossible. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is and is something so totally ludicrous you think nobody could do it, but of course Tom Cruise can. And of course it self-destructs and you got to have to choose, right? Have you ever felt like you've been given such an impossible task there is no way on earth you could fulfill it? It is so incredibly outlandish you think who could ever ask for this? Those of you starting college... Your first class, every time they hand out this piece of paper called a uh, syllabus, and it has everything you're supposed to do this semester. And every time you go to a first class, and maybe you have five or six of these, you get this thing and you go, there ain't no way, and you're swimming in overwhelmingness immediately. How many remember that feeling, that sinking feeling? Well, then you can go to Harding. You must have gone to ASU. Anyway, so syllabus overwhelming how can i do all this or maybe you bring that baby home that first baby home and your first night alone no parents around there's no nurse you can't push the button and the nurse come in because you home now and so it's you or nothing and that baby just cries and cries and cries and you go god can i send him back that was my first night no offense noah i'm glad you're here i'm glad you're here maybe you move to a new place or go to a new school and everything is new you got to start all over and you go this is just not possible maybe you get that new technological gadget and you get that 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 big old how to program this thing thing you know in small like Japanese letters and stuff and you're like how do I do this there's a lot of people who will never come to church and never be part of what you're a part of because they feel that way about the Christian faith. There is no way I can live that way. And you know what? It's, it's true. I can understand it. I, I want you to think of, just yell out some. What are some of the commands God gives us that you go, that's just impossible. How, anybody? Love your enemies. Who, who does that? You know, turn the other cheek or pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. How in the world can we possibly do that? But there's one above all others, and it's in 1 Peter 1.16, when he says, I want you to be holy just like I'm holy. Huh. Do you know yourself? Think about your life and your struggles. Now I want you to do this. I want you to tell yourself, look in a mirror, knowing yourself, and you say, today I need to be like God. And you'll be like Sarah, who's told when she's 90, next by next year you'll have a baby. And you're, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what I would think about when somebody tells me, you're supposed to be holy like God is holy. And immediately in our Bible classes, we say, well, hold it, hold it, church, hold it, church. There's, there's, what it really means is, just try. That's not what he says. We want to water it down. We want to get exclusions and writers that tell you why. Don't take this literally, church. Don't really. That's not really what this means. But then he says it over and over again. In the Sermon on the Mount, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Whoa. Oh, and that's not what he really means. No, no, no. You shall be holy, for I am holy. That's God telling you that. And then we got this Hebrews chapter 12. I want you to see this on the screen. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. 
He's serious about this. He's not joking, and he's not just giving you some wild thing to say, well, if we get halfway there, we'll be okay. God's serious about this, church. You are obligated this week. Here's your marching orders. Here's your mission. You are to be like God in the world. That's your mission. 1 Peter 1, 16. In every class, we may try to water that down a little bit. And part of the problem is nobody knows what holiness is anymore. Do you remember when you used to go to church and the church building was holy? And you don't run in the building because it's God's house. You don't chew gum in the building because it's God's house. You don't bring drinks in the building because it's God's house. And you don't lie because you're, you can do it in the parking lot, but you can't do it at church. That's what they'd say to you. Don't lie to somebody. And in fact, I remember being told you shouldn't talk about Cardinal Baseball and you shouldn't just chat, chit chat in church. This is serious because when you enter that room, what is this room? You call it an auditorium, but you know what we used to call it? Sanctuary. And we understood a little bit about holiness by there's a different way. You're supposed to dress your best to come here. And we're trying to we're trying to get away from that as well we should. But then what is the pattern of holiness? The U.S. flag used to be holy. Remember that? The sacredness of the flag. Now that's not even. So what's holiness anymore? And God just says, I tell you what, let me give you a pattern that is forever going to be right. I want you to be holy like me. God speaking here. I want you to be holy like me. You might as well ask me to pitch a no-hitter for the Cardinals tonight. I just can't imagine that's even possible. And we start our chuckling and we start our watering down this passage. That's not really what it means. But Peter in this passage says, yes, it is possible to be holy. And to be holy, you need two things. You need the means of being holy, the how. You need to know how you can be holy. And then you need the motivation. Why should I bother with it? Because I'm going to tell you what, church, it's, it's troublesome. It takes work, it takes energy, it takes effort to be holy, and so I'm going to have to convince you why you should bother. Motivation is for next week. I want you to think about it. Next week I'm going to tell you why you should bother with holiness. This week I want to tell you it is possible. The mission he's called us to, while it sounds impossible, is possible. And it begins in verse 13. Therefore, we're going to stop at the therefore. Because the therefore says, I want you to go back to the first, what, 12 verses. And I want you to know that you must understand the first 12 verses before we can go on to the next three. And the first 12 verses are all about verse number three. You have experienced new birth. Step number one is, if you want to be holy as God is holy, you must experience new birth, which is a gift from Him. It's not an act that you can do. It's not a work that you can achieve. The first step in a holy life is to know and experience the new birth. When you're born again, God makes you holy. Something that you can't do yourself. No matter how good or nice or sweet or polite you might be, you cannot be holy apart from the new birth. And God does not call us to be nice and sweet in the world. Too many people are saying, here's what a Christian is, a person who's nice and sweet in the world. No, a Christian is a person who's holy from the world. It's a difference. And God makes you holy a bull through, I don't even know if that's a word, but we just created it. Write it down, put it on Twitter, and let's become famous. Holyable. God makes you holyable through His Holy Spirit in you. The new birth is a prerequisite to any attempt to be holy. Prerequisite. Finish this for me. Prerequisite for Algebra 2 would be... You can't take Algebra 2 without taking Algebra 1. You cannot be holy without God making you holy through His Holy Spirit. And so in the new birth, in chapter th 1, verse 3, that new birth is what equips you to be holy before God. You may remember that good man in the New Testament named Cornelius. He was a very good man, and God came to him through an angel and said, You know what? I see your good works. 
But Cornelius, good works is not enough to be holy. The, Hebrews doesn't say without being good, you won't see the Lord. It says without being holy. Cornelius, you're a good man, but you're not holy. And if you want to see the Lord, you must be holy. And so I'm going to send a messenger to you to help you learn how to be holy. And when Peter comes and he preaches the message to him, what does Cornelius do? He experiences new birth and he becomes holy. You can't be holy by your conduct alone. Only God has the power to make you holy. You must experience new birth. Too many people going around, we'll all get to heaven if we're just good people. That is simply not true. Good people don't get to heaven. Holy people do. And God is the one who makes you holy. I, I like to compare this to the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. The book of Ephesians, the last three chapters, 4, 5, and 6, are full of what we call imperatives. These commands that God tells us. Tell the truth. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Don't, don't you know, be sexually pure and all that stuff. All, all that is the commands of first chapters 4 through 6. But before he ever tells them how they need to act... He spends three chapters telling them what God's already done for them. There is only one imperative in the first three chapters, and it's the word remember. All you need to do to experience new birth is remember what Jesus has done for you and respond to him in new birth. And by doing that, you become holy. Do not preach to the world about how they need to behave. Here's why the world doesn't respond to us. The world is in the old man. The old man is right here. The old man, this is us before we were believers. This is when you live by your desires. This is the old man. Over here is the new man. This is the Christian who's been washed by God through the waters of baptism, the Holy Spirit's in his life. He's living the new life. He's the new man. This is who we preach to on Sunday mornings. Our sermons are directed to the new man. And we're saying to you, be like God, be holy like God, and behave yourself and live a good holy life and know what God's done for you. The old man who listens to these sermons, maybe on TV or maybe on CD or whatever, is listening to these sermons thinking, I could never live that way. And so many people will never darken the door because we're preaching to them messages that belong to Christians only. These don't belong out in the world. The world's living like it's supposed to live. What we need to be preaching to the world is what God's done for them. How God has gone the extra mile through his son and purged them of their, the, the ability to purge them of their sin if they'll just trust in Jesus, right? But when you're the old man listening to what the new man's expected of him, I could never live that life, forget it, I choose not to accept the mission. But you see, there's a step between the old man and the new man. It's new birth. You're immersed in the waters of baptism. Not only are your sins forgiven, that's the small thing. The big thing is the Holy Spirit comes into your life and equips you and enables you to live a holy life. You can't live a holy life without the Holy Spirit. You cannot. And you can't have the Holy Spirit until the Lord gives him to you as a gift through the waters of baptism and the new birth. And then you're a new person. Here's what I would liken that to. Here's a 10-year-old kid looking over at one of the doctors here. Dr. Stidman will say, I could never do what that doctor does. And he's right. I don't want a 10-year-old doing what that doctor does, right? I could never do what Dr. Stidman does over there. But he's coming from the vantage of the old man. What happens if he goes through about, oh, 15 years of medical training residency and all that stuff and gets his doctorate and suddenly he is on this side he's been equipped by his training to become a new person now he is a doctor and he can do those things you cannot from the vantage point of the old man disqualify yourself from being a new man because you don't have the holy spirit when you become a person who experiences the new birth god equips you to be holy and you are now holyable That's why in Romans 8, after Paul describes the struggle of sin even after he became a Christian, he says, but there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And that's what we say. The second step, real quickly, is this. I'm not going to say real quickly. It's not going to be quickly. Verse 13. 
Therefore, experiencing the new birth. Secondly, you mentally prepare. Now, the person who read this morning, Jerry Taylor. Is that right? <laughs> See, I'm learning names. You can't imagine. So Jerry Taylor gets up and he reads, and it's obviously out of the King James Version. I have no problem with versions. I don't care which version you use. But did you hear what he said? Gird up the loins of your mind. Did you all know that your mind had loins? You're baffled too, aren't you? Gird up the loins of your mind. And I listen to that and I go, what? How many of you, before you left your house today, girded up the loins of your mind? Did anybody? Anybody gird up the loins of your mind? You have no idea, do you? you don't? See, I don't either. That's King James language, but I love it because it's very picturesque. In my version, ESV, it says, prepare your minds for action. You've got to mentally prepare. Paul says it this way. He says, you've got to put off the old man, and you've got to put on the new man, Ephesians chapter 4. But he says, in between there, you renew the attitude of your mind. You clean your brain out. You don't just wash off those actions. You also clean your brain out. Prepare your minds for action. What does that mean? You've got to, every day when you get up, you, you, I know what you do. You go and you put your makeup on, ladies. And, or you put your whatever stuff on, guys, the smell good and all that stuff. And you get yourself ready, and you prepare yourself for the day. My thing is this. Did you mentally prepare yourself while you're getting ready to live a holy life today? Did you really gear yourself up and say, today I'm going to live out holiness it's great that you have clothes on. Thank you. That's part of holiness. But did you prepare your mind for the day? This gird the loins of your mind comes from this image back in Exodus where the tenth plague was coming as the going to take the lives of the firstborn in Egypt. Do you remember this? Yes? So as, 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 as the angel's going to come by, God says, I want to prepare you. He will avoid all the doors that have blood on them. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And so he says, after you wipe blood on the door, I also want you to eat that animal that you sacrifice inside this house. And so they bring the animal inside the house. And he said, listen to me, guys. I'm going to come around and I'm going to knock on your door. And I don't want you reclining to eat. I don't want you sitting there relaxed like you're going to watch an evening of football and just draw out this dining experience. I want you to eat with your loins girded. In other words, your belt is on, your clothes are ready, your bags are packed. When the door, when, when I knock on the door, I want you ready to leave right then. No, ladies, it's not time to go and primp and put on your lipstick. I want you to be ready to go right now. When the door, when I knock on the door, you've got to go. You don't get ready to go. You don't start thinking about going. You go. I want you to gird the loins, he says, and be ready to run because you've got to hurry up. They're going to come after you again. And what Peter is saying in this passage is, do you start your day girding up the loins? You're getting ready to live a holy life. It's a mental process. There is a mental thing you go through every day. Uh, your, the basic Christian life is lived between your ears. When you make evaluations and judgments all day long about what's the holy thing to do, when I'm having a conversation with somebody and it turns, again, the words turn, and the words that we use and the subjects we talk about, when all of a sudden it is unholy, I've got to think through how do I do the holy thing here, and you don't do that accidentally, spontaneously, like a Las Vegas impromptu marriage. It doesn't work that way. You've got to think this thing through. And God knows the value of mental preparation. It would be much like, do you wish that you didn't have nine months of childbearing before you have the child? Wouldn't it be nice to just, it's, you're pregnant one day and the baby's here the next? Or is that nine months a really good buffer? We got some people who can testify. I know uh, uh, Jennifer Rickman, right? I, I was asking her the other day, or Jessica, Jessica Rickman. I was asking her, I said, are you ready? And she said, yes and no. Yes, I'm ready to be over with, but we're not ready. We've got, we got to get the room ready and all this stuff. Bridget better be because it may happen this morning before this thing's over, right? 
God gives you this time period to get acclimated the thought of being a parent. God does the same thing with us when he says, I want you to be mentally prepared. There's two things. One is you dress for this action. You get your mind ready. You gird the loins of your mind. It's like a person who is going to go on a date. It's a Christian going on a date. And it's, you can tell by the clothes they're wearing whether holiness is a big deal or not. I one time went out for baseball in high school and I was terrible at it, but I thought I'd give it a shot anyway. And I lost heart, but I thought, well, I'm going I'm to go ahead and continue this anyway. But I had a debate on the same day as I had ball practice, and so I forgot all my workout clothes, and I go out on the field. I've got dress shoes on. I've got dress slacks on. I, had a, I did take the tie off, but I had a dress shirt on. And I'm out there in the field with a baseball glove, fielding the ball, and then I'm at the plate. You know, they're pitching to me, and I'm in a dress suit. How serious did I look to the coach about making the baseball team? It didn't look serious to him at all. It was a joke. And that's the way sometimes we, as we leave our houses, we're no more mentally prepared to make holy decisions than that person is to win a spot on the baseball team. If you're going to go swimming, don't go in a three-piece suit. It doesn't fit. And so he says to us, first of all, prepare your minds for action. And the second word he says for mentally being prepared is be sober-minded. Don't let yourself get intoxicated by anything that overwhelms your mind so you can't make a sound spiritual judgment about things. Now, we think of alcohol this way. When you're so drunk with alcohol, you can't make right judgments. There are other things spiritually that can consume your mind. Jesus said it this way in the parables, right? That mind, that, that, that seed that he had was so overwhelmed with the cares of this life that he could not live the Christian life. I want you to think of a couple of things. Young people, maybe we're so consumed with the idea of being accepted and liked by everybody that we base our decisions on what other people will think of us and it drowns out what God will think of us. So consumed with our image. And who says that's young people alone? That's older people too. What about that woman who's a dating age and she goes out there and she's so consumed by this handsome guy that she doesn't think about this. In order for me to be engaged with this guy, I've got to in some extent disengage from God. If you have to disengage from God to engage with a guy, he's a guy you don't need. You're intoxicated. You can't think clearly, and you go ahead and you marry that person, and you lose your faith, and you wonder, where did I go wrong? You went wrong because you were intoxicated. You weren't soberly thinking this. He Hall has a great theological section in their show. This woman comes out, and she says, ladies, let me give you some advice. There are some women I have known who love facial hair and they fall in love with the mustache and they're so enamored with the mustache that they get carried away and marry the whole man. You know what that means? You found one feature you really like and you were so overwhelmed with it, you married the whole dude. And it was not a good move. Donnie Osmond will tell you this. With Barbara Walters, he'll only marry a Mormon. And she says, but what happens if you fall in love with someone who's not a Mormon? He says, you make a choice about who you fall in love with. It is not just kind of a random thing. I will not fall in love with someone who's not a Mormon. But what happens if you do, she says. I won't. It's my choice, which is true. Is he right? In our world, we're being told you can't control your attractions. That's a bunch of baloney. That is baloney. You're being intoxicated by a world's message that's a total lie. You control what you do. 
You have control over what you do, and you, you're mentally responsible for the decisions you make. We've got a judge and a jury these days that give people too many leniencies. If you did this, if you were intoxicated, you are still responsible for it. Period. And that's what he says to us. Control your minds, right? Mentally prepare to be holy by, by dressing for holiness in your mind and by being sober. One last thing he tells us, and it has in the realm of action. After you've experienced new birth, and while you're mentally preparing, he says this. We're in now in verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of their former ignorance. Don't let the way of life of the world around you dictate to you how you act. That's how the world does it. Instead, he says in verse 15... But as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all your conduct. So now you physically live out holiness. You choose holy conduct. We are in Bible class, and what we are doing in Bible class, and what Cabot is doing in Bible class with young people is going over scenarios. If we take this verse, this passage, this truth, this concept of Scripture seriously, you will do this. If you take this seriously, this is what it'll look like in your life. But the question becomes, when they leave that Bible class and that scenario comes up in real life, what are you prepared to do? Now, if you look at 1 Peter chapter 4, three verses over, go ahead, next screen. This is how he describes the difference between their last life and now. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly life for evil human desires. They've been converted now. They do not live the way the rest of the world does, but rather for the will of God. You've spent enough time in the past doing what the pagans choose to do, and he gives this list of things they do. This is how they meet their desires. Now, here's what he's saying about this. The world has plenty of offerings. You, we all have certain desires. We know what they are. You've got hunger. You've got thirst. You've got the sexual attraction. You've got also recreation. You've got all these desires that we have, and they're all fine. But when you go out into the world, the world offers so many ways to satisfy those desires, hundreds of them. And the world's saying, whatever you want, choose it. And what Christians say is this, I must use my new mental, mentally prepared way of judging, and I must choose a means that is right and legitimate. So, you go out in the world and you have these desires, there are, way to, there are Christian ways to meet the desires of the body. There are all sorts of Christian ways, but there's all sorts of wrong ways to meet those desires, and the world is offering them all the time. And you have to practice mental discernment and to choose, is this a right or a wrong way? Let's say some of you are trying out the latest diet, and you read in the book, these are the foods that are good for you, these are the foods that are bad for you, avoid these and eat these. And you've got that list down in your head. You've memorized that list, but now it's Sunday. Now it's Sunday, the preacher's gone too long. I'm predicting, I'm prophesying, the preacher's gone too long. Your stomach is rumbling. You're starting to lose control over your ability to really think this through. And now you're going to leave here and you're going to go to one of those places that has a huge three-acre buffet. And it's got all sorts of, you've got the things that you should eat on that buffet, and you've got the things you shouldn't eat. They're all out there, and you have to go, and you have to pick and choose on your own. And there's nobody telling you what to do, and there's nobody saying this is off bounds for you. You are now at the, you, the only thing guiding you is your mental judgment. You know already what you should eat and what you shouldn't. The question is, when you're really hungry, can you make the right decision? This is why they tell you not to go shopping while you're hungry, because you make all sorts of stupid, impulsive decisions. Christian life is called the life of following the example of God. And he says you can be holy. God, through the new birth, makes you holyable. And then through his word, he gives you the ability to train your mind what is holy and what is not. And then step three is largely up to the Holy Spirit's leading in you and you cooperating with the Spirit. When you get out there and you have the choices, can you make the right choice and actually live it out? You can this week be holy like God is holy. It is possible and it is actually commanded. And here's the best part. Even after God has 
given you new birth and made you holy and you've mentally prepared and you're trying your best, you're going to fail. You're going to slip up, but those failures won't be fatal. And it's not like the moment you sin, you are lost forever until you say a quick prayer of repentance and then you're back in the... No, as you're walking in the light, striving to live a holy life, and you stumble every once in a while, that forgiveness is still flowing. It's still there. You're still holy and pure. If you are in the process of trying to be holy, God views you as completely holy, and that's what you've been called to. So this week, you've got your marching orders. You see, unlike that video a minute ago, where he says, your mission, should you choose to accept it? If you are a believer, you've already accepted it. It's already yours. If, you are a, if you've experienced a new birth and you are a Christian, you have no choice. Here is your mission. Be holy like God's holy. If you're not a believer and you're thinking, how in the world could I ever do that? You can't, but God can. You can experience the new birth in the waters of baptism as the Holy Spirit makes you holyable. Then you will have an obligation to study Scripture and mentally prepare yourself and make those decisions as they come up. This week, you have your mission. Be holy like our God is holy. Whatever it takes to do that, church, do it as we stand and sing to encourage you.